Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Sorry to cut into your delicious dinner. Thank you to Marina and her team for always feeding us uh, such delicious and nourishing food. Um, so it, really, really do please continue to, to eat um, you know, while we have this conversation. Feel free to get up and... and uh, refill your plate or grab dessert from the back table. Um, but we wanted to, to get started, mindful of the time. And so it really, it, my honor um, once again to, to welcome Nathan Thrall here to the ECAR community. Uh, Nathan, as I said before, is the author of this brand new book, A Day in the Life of Abed Salama, Anatomy of a Jerusalem Tragedy. Um, Nathan is an author, a journalist, a peace activist, uh, and you've written brilliantly and movingly and extensively um, about life in Israel and Palestine, and we're so fortunate to, to learn with you and to speak with you this evening. So this newest book of yours came out on October 3rd of this year. Uh, and it tells the story, I'm going to let you tell this in greater detail, but it, it tells the story of a particular tragedy from 10 years ago uh, of a fatal bus accident which claimed the lives of six Palestinian children and one teacher. And surrounding this story is your heartbreaking portrayal of life in the occupied territories in East Jerusalem and the daily indignities that Palestinians face in this context. Four days after your book came out, uh, we witnessed with horror and despair the events of October 7th. And every day since, our hearts have been aching for the Israeli civilians massacred on that day and the hostage, hostages taken and still in captivity. And, and, and in the aftermath, of October 7th, we've witnessed, and I know we're all feeling in this community, the, the chilling rise of anti-Semitism, refusal to condemn Hamas's behavior, new doubts about whether our allies on the progressive left care about us, our lives, Israel's right to exist. Uh, it's a moment of being scared of being afraid, of grieving, of being lonely. And as Rabbi Braus has always reminded us, and we heard this message for those of you who are there from the parents' circle uh, two weeks ago when they were here with us at Ikar, opening our hearts to the suffering of others, it doesn't diminish our own grief. We can hold multiple truths simultaneously. Um, this book talk has been on our calendar uh, for many months because our community has been and remains committed to the vital work of ending the occupation. And as I said, I admit it's a hard time to talk about the occupation when our hearts and minds are overwhelmed by the scenes coming out daily of Israel and Gaza. But as I read your book these last two days, really from a place within my own grief, one of the things I was reminded of, which you do so poignantly, is that telling stories about real people, right, as gut-wrenching as it may be, is a way to open our hearts to the many layers of suffering here and, and, in fact, begin a conversation about how to shift the status quo so that eventually we're able to tell a different story. Um, so I want to thank you, Nathan, for being here. I know that many communities have canceled on you the last few weeks. Um, and I know that the past few weeks have been particularly difficult for you as well. Um, you live in Jerusalem with your wife and three daughters, and um, just this week, as you shared with, with us just a moment ago, you, you brought your wife and your three girls to the U.S. Um, 
So I know that your heart is heavy and holding a lot right now. Um, and I want to thank you all, our community, for uh, stretching your heart this evening to hear what, Nathan, you're going to share with us uh, this evening. Okay, so just a quick show of hands. Has anyone had the chance to read Nathan's new book? Okay, a few hands. I mean, it, it came out October 3rd, so I, I, don't, I don't blame you all. Um, so, Nathan, I, I want to ask you to, to maybe start by um, telling us a little bit about how you came to meet Abed Salama, the, one of the main characters of this story, and, and maybe also what drew you in about his story in particular. Um, thank you. Thank you for your words, and thank you all for coming. Um, uh, we're all... Um, grieving right now, and um, I'm, I'm grateful that everybody has um, come here and, and is listening to this um, in the midst of our grief. Um, so I live in uh, Jerusalem. I live uh, in a neighborhood called Musrara, uh, right next to uh, the old city, and um, I would... As part of my work, I, I did a lot of work in, in the West Bank over the last uh, decade. And as part of my work, I would often drive uh, north on the main uh, north-south road, Kfish um, Misbarachat. And I would um, pass a, a walled community that is within municipal Jerusalem, but separated by the separation barrier. And I would um, not really notice it or, or pay it uh, any mind. And I don't think I was uh, unique uh, in that. And um, in 2012, there was a uh, terrible accident involving a school bus filled with uh, kindergartners um, who came from this community, that came from the same city that I live in, but live a radically different uh, existence uh, from mine. Um, these are people who are paying municipal taxes to most of them to, um, to Jerusalem, and they're getting almost no services, and there are no lanes in the road, the um, road is uh, unpaved, there's a no sidewalks, no playgrounds. Um, there's a single public school uh, in a former uh, goat pen. Most of the kids have to go through a checkpoint to get to the rest of, to get to their schools inside uh, Jerusalem. And, uh, and so after this crash, which was a, a, a major uh, tragedy for, for the members of this community, I, I couldn't stop thinking about the lives of these people who share a city with me, um, but have a very different uh, experience. And uh, I sought out everyone connected to the crash in, in any way. Um, parents, uh, stu children who are now older, uh, students, um, and uh, the, some of the emergency service responders, a, a settler paramedic, um, the founder of the settlement of Adam, which is right next to where the accident took place, um, the head of the Binyamin Brigade um, in, uh, uh, in the West Bank. Um, all of these people were uh, intimately involved in what happened that day, and I realized that by telling the story of this accident, I could actually tell um, the entire story of Israel-Palestine. And um, that was really my, my ambition with this, with this book. And if you don't mind, I, I'll read actually a, a short passage from, um, from the accident scene. And uh, the part that I'm going to read uh, involves a uh, Palestinian doctor and mother uh, named Huda Dahbur. And she happened to stumble on the accident site with her medical team. She led a, a medical team that worked for the UN Refugee Agency, UNRWA. 
and uh, they just happened to be driving by when they saw a bus in flames, and they got out and started to help with the rescue. Um, and there's another character who's mentioned here whose name is Salem, and he was another bystander, and he uh, single-handedly, with the help of one teacher who, who passed away, um, rescued dozens of children. Um, so that helps you understand what's coming. The teacher died from the accident? Yes. Yeah. Yes. A teacher named Ula uh, died helping uh, Salem. Nearly 20 minutes had passed since Huda and her staff had come upon the burning bus. Flames and smoke were still pouring from the smashed windows. Huda's driver, Abu Faraj, was directing traffic, keeping an open path for the evacuees and telling drivers of oncoming cars to turn back. The, crowd, the crowd had grown so large that Huda could no longer see the driver and the teacher she and Salem had pulled from the front of the bus. She was focused on the children, gently carrying them with one of the UN nurses to the cars that had stopped at the accident site. Many of the drivers had volunteered to transport the burn victims and stood ready to race to the nearest accessible hospital, which, for most of them, was in Ramallah. The hospitals in Jerusalem were far better, but only those with blue IDs could reach them. A few of the drivers did have blue IDs, and some took off in the direction of Hadassah Hospital at Mount Scopus in Jerusalem. The, major the majority, those with green IDs, went in the opposite direction, along the flooded road to Ramallah. Nearly all the children had been brought off the bus when Salem, who had by now gone in and out of the flames several times, saw that Ula, the teacher and his partner in the rescue, was trapped beneath the front seat and her leg was burning. But by the time he got to her, it was too late. She was gone. He carried Ula from the bus and placed her on the ground. Her nephew, Sadi, watched in the rain while a man covered her with his coat. In all of this, Salem had felt nothing, not even as someone in the crowd grabbed at his arm and pinched him. One of Huda's nurses yelled to him that his jacket was on fire. He shouted back that it was not. The nurse put it out as he went to climb back into the bus. The few children still inside were no longer alive. The last boy Salem pulled out was facing down, crouched behind the frame of a seat. He was still wearing a backpack, which Salem held to pick the boy up. Stepping out of the bus for the final time, Salem broke out weeping, shouting that he should have saved more. Somehow, not a hair on his head was burned. Abu Faraj stood unmoving, in shock, as if mesmerized by the flames. Huda turned to the nurse beside her and saw that her face was black and streaked by rain. She realized she must look the same. They were soaked and bone-weary, and there was nothing more for them to do. When a Palestinian ambulance finally arrived, most of the injured children had already been evacuated. Huda didn't even notice it. The bus was still crackling with flames, and there was much shouting and commotion. Not a single firefighter, police officer, or soldier had come. Huda wanted to follow the children. She found her team, and they returned to the UNRWA van. Nida, the pregnant pharmacist, was still inside, inconsolable. Abu Faraj started dropping off everyone at home as Huda called around and confirmed that most of the children were in Ramallah. Then she phoned her UNRWA supervisor. He didn't understand the magnitude of the accident and demanded that the team turn around and go to Khan al-Ahmar or he would cut their pay. Huda refused and said he should just cut her salary, no one else's. After stopping for a quick shower, Huda set off for the hospital, taking the clinic's social worker with her. When they got there, word spread that Huda had been at the crash. A great many parents and other relatives sought her out, asking whether she had seen a boy with a Spider-Man backpack, a girl with her hair and yellow ribbons. Huda told them all the same thing. The children had been covered in soot, and she couldn't tell what they were wearing. Going from room to room, 
Huda checked on the injured children, soothing them. Since leaving the bus, she had felt something nagging at her. She was sure the kindergartners had been silent, at least early in their ordeal. Now, at the bed of one girl, Huda asked her why that was, why she had heard no sound. We were so scared, the girl said. When we saw the flames, we thought we had died. We thought we were in hell. Nathan, there are so many layers um, to this tragedy, to the excerpt you just read, to what Huda saw when she arrived, who was there, who was not there, to the uncertainty of where these children were taken, the different hospitals, and who had access to what hospital based on status and ID. Um, can you speak a little bit about um, the layer of who showed up at what time and why this particular tragedy, right, which in some ways is a tragedy that could take place anywhere, a, a bus accident, a collision, it could take place anywhere, but there are elements of this tragedy that are specific to where it happened and the, the players involved, the governments involved, the measures of control involved that added layers of suffering to this particular tragedy. Yeah. Um, so the, the um, community where these people, uh, the parents and the children come from, uh, it's called Anatta. And uh, together with the Shuafat refugee camp, um, it, uh, it makes up a closed enclave. So it has the separation barrier, the 26-foot tall uh, concrete wall uh, surrounding it on three sides. And then there's a fourth wall uh, on, on the um, other side, which is a wall that runs through Route 4370, which is famously referred to as the Apartheid Road. So it's a road where Israelis can go on one side and Palestinians on the other. And there are two exits in this walled uh, enclave. One is into the rest of Jerusalem. And if you had a blue ID and you live in the right half of the enclave, then you can go uh, through that checkpoint. And the other is, is to the rest of the West Bank. And um, what you have in this community is members of the same family. Some have green IDs, some have blue IDs. Um, technically, half of it is officially within the sovereign state of Israel. It was annexed in 1967. It's part of municipal East Jerusalem. Uh, and half of it is unannexed. But if you go inside, you can't actually tell the difference. It all looks the same. Um, the only way you can really tell is if you go up very closely to a building and you see a blue and white uh, placard in Hebrew and Arabic with a street name and number and then the last building that has that is, you know, the last building of municipal Jerusalem. But aside from that, the whole area uh, looks like one, one, um, an area of gross neglect. Um, and all of this is just, you know, underneath the campus of, of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem um, at Mount Scopus. So from the grounds of the campus, you can look down and see this whole uh, enclave. Uh, and the IDs are relevant because the students at the school, you know, there was a sh ma major shortage of classrooms in this community um, uh, so that students were actually, they were doing double shifts in the schools. There was, a, in East Jerusalem, a shortage of something like 2,000 classrooms. And, um, and within this enclave itself, there was only one municipal school uh, as I mentioned, in a former goat pen. So most of the schools were through a checkpoint and the parents were afraid of sending their kids through this checkpoint and having interactions with soldiers uh, every morning and afternoon. And so many parents, those who could afford it, would, would send them to a private school, which was um, within this enclave. And that's the school where this, this uh, accident took place. 
And so in the school, you had both blue ID holders with the Jerusalem ID and green ID holders with the West Bank ID, which meant that the bus couldn't go into uh, the rest of Jerusalem uh, with the, um, to the other side of the wall and through the checkpoint. And so there are many play areas they could have gone to that are very close by, for example, in Pisgat Ze'ev, just right on the other side of the wall. Um, and instead, they followed this winding path of the wall to go to a distant play area within municipal Jerusalem, but on the other side of the wall, right at the outskirts of Ramallah, in an area very much like Anatta and Shuafat camp called Kufar Aqab. And they passed through a uh, checkpoint, and after passing through the checkpoint, they were struck by a giant semi-trailer that was on its way back and forth um, carrying stones from a, a settlement quarry. And it was, they were carrying it from a settlement quarry to a factory in the um, Atarot industrial zone in East Jerusalem. And the uh, bus uh, was uh, struck by the, the, the semi-trailer and it flipped over and caught fire immediately. And the road on which this took place was in area C of the West Bank. This is the 60, roughly 62% of the West Bank that is under not just Israeli uh, control, but administration. So there's no PA uh, allowed, no Palestinian authority allowed in Area C. So this is a road that's patrolled by not just the army, but Israeli national police. Traffic tickets are given out on it. Uh, it's, it's under full Israeli control, and the PA isn't allowed there. Um, but more importantly, it's, it's right on the other side of the wall, and it's an area that is totally neglected, so much so that even within Anatta and Shuafat camp, um, the emergency services aren't allowed to go in without a, an army or border police uh, escort. Um, and there have been many tragedies that have occurred as a result. Just a few years ago, there was a fire in Kufar Aqab where the fire trucks were held up because they didn't have the escort of uh, security forces. And people, ordinary people, were left to deal with this fire. And uh, several people died, or at least one person died. I can't remember the numbers in Kufar Aqab. Um, and, uh, and so this was an incident like that. Um, it occurred in an area that's under full Israeli control, but is an area that is filled with uh, Palestinians living under the other, on the other side of the wall with green and blue IDs, and, and really they, it's often referred to in the Israeli press as a no man's land. The PA isn't allowed there, Israel ignores it, and, um, and so what I describe in the book is how many of the events of that day were really you know, foreseeable uh, consequences of an overall policy of neglect, and, and even the, the wall, I, one of the central characters in the book is the architect of the wall, a, a colonel uh, in the army named uh, Dani Tirza, and, and he was the architect not just of the wall, but actually he, sh he drew the maps that created area A and B and C. A area C is the 62%, area A and B are the remaining 38%, uh, uh, um, of the West Bank, and area A and B are little islands that are surrounded by a sea of, of contiguous area C. So there are 165 area A and B pockets are surrounded by an island of area C control. Um, and so it was, there were, you know, multiple delays that occurred that day. Um, the first fire truck the first Israeli fire truck that arrived came more than a half hour after the accident. Um, and by then, all of the kids had been evacuated. Most of the parents, by the time they got there, all of the kids were gone. Um, and they were all transported just by ordinary people who came with their cars and put a kindergartner in the back seat and drove off in whichever direction, depending on whether they had a, access to Jerusalem or not. Um, and Abid himself, you know, he has a green ID and he arrives at the accident site and he asks, you know, where are the kids? And 
from the crowd, he hears all different kinds of rumors that some are at this hospital in West Jerusalem, some are at another hospital in East Jerusalem, some are uh, uh, at the military base, um, the Rama base that's just a minute up the road, some are at the Ramallah hospital, some even were in Nablus. Um, and so he, with a green ID, can't go and check for his son in uh, most of those places. He can't go to the military base, he can't go uh, into West or East Jerusalem. Um, so he goes to Ramallah and he, it's more than 36 hours before he finds out the fate of his uh, son. And really, you know, the, the, the purpose of, of telling, the, you know, a story like this of something that's commonplace that happens all over the world was that it was an opportunity to describe exactly as you say what it means for this ordinary thing to happen in this place. It was a way to illuminate the system in which all of these people live and also to illuminate the, you know, the, the ways in which Jews and Palestinians living in close proximity, you know, do interact with one another. They, you know, came into collision on this day with this accident, but one of the themes of the book is also all of the different ways in which they do interact. You know, Abed has a cousin who works in the PA, uh, in the security establishment of the PA in the interior ministry, and he's a big wig. And uh, Abed very much disapproves of his his work. Um, and he has some of his closest friends, he says to me that his closest friends are Israelis, and most of them are generals. And he's a very um, witty guy, he's uh, very um, uh, cunning and sarcastic and politically sophisticated, um, but he is very much a part of this system uh, that had been quite robust until recently. Um, yeah. Yesterday when we were speaking, you, know, you, you shared that one of your um, motivations for writing this book, um, which of course you, you, you've been researching and wrote well before the events of this past month, um, was to paint a human picture of everyday life in the settlement and under Israeli occupation and, and how it negatively impacts everyone involved, how it negatively impacts the Israeli Jews, how it negatively impacts Palestinians. Um, and that when, God willing, this war comes to an end, may it come to an end speedily, um, what is the calm that we're returning to? Right? What's, what's the status quo of before October 7th? Yeah. Right? And part of the picture that you present in the book is that it's, it's a deeply troubling status quo. Yeah. But I guess I want to ask you, because we are in the aftermath of October 7th, um, I want to ask you about the the work of ending the occupation, the work of um, r resisting the efforts of the government to increase the settlement expansion that could be a conclusion of this current war, that could be a decision that the Israeli government makes. Right? Similarly, you know, we're in a moment in which we might see a renewed determination amongst Palestinians to engage in, in armed conflict. We don't, we don't know where this is going, but we know and we pray that where we're going after this war is actually not back to where we were before the war, but to some new reality that hopefully addresses some of both the systemic and the current issues that, that we're, we're facing. And so I wanna ask you what, what voices need to be amplified or what changes need to be made in order to move forward towards a vision of just and peaceful society for all? Simple question. <laughs> so, I mean, my, my overall uh, feeling about October 7th is, first of all, I think that um, 
it will have decades-long consequences um, for both societies. And um, it's very hard to predict in the middle of all of this grief and all of these emotions um, what is um, what is the more powerful effect of all of this, because there will be contradictory effects. I think one effect is that October 7th is an affirmation of um, you know, what the right has been saying for a long time. And I think there is no denying that. And I think that um, th that will be one of the consequences is pushing a lot of people to the right. Um, I think that another consequence, and it's not clear to me how strong this will be, is that, you know, people do recognize that what was in place for decades up until October 7th, clearly that can't recur. And there needs to be an openness to some other arrangement. And, and I do believe that, um, you know, the, the Israeli public needs an answer, a credible answer to the question of how will this not happen again? And I don't think that any of the options that are being discussed right now can offer that. I don't think that, um, that I don't think Israel can achieve its, its stated aim of eliminating Hamas as a military and, and governing entity, um, not at a price that it's willing to pay. And, um, and and so what I uh, imagine is that there will be renewed efforts to try and find a different kind of answer, which would likely, because that's what all the international community supports, is, is, is likely to be some effort at two states that would involve dismantling Hamas, uh, the integration of all of these militias, they're not the only ones in Gaza, into the security forces of a state. And none of these things are actual you know, guarantees or, or, or a sh no one should feel great about any of these options. Uh, but, um, but that is, I think, a more credible answer to the question of how is this really different? And how uh, how is October seventh not going to to happen again? Now, that that's just to say those efforts will be made, and you already hear Biden talking about it. And even in the, I mean, at different, I've spoken at other Jewish communities in the U.S. I've spoken at different synagogues. I've heard from from rabbis that they're hearing more questions about two states in the last three weeks than they've heard in the last ten years. So. Um, so I do think that there will be both of those effects. I think there will be a, a, a new willingness to consider um, a radically different arrangement. Um, and I think that there will also be a, a, a strengthening of the right. And there will also be opportunism by some, you know, settlers in the West Bank now that between 2022 and the end of September, there were 1,100 Palestinians forcibly displaced by, mostly by settler militias in the West Bank. Uh, and so entire communities were uh, moved uh, and uh, uprooted. And between October 7th and today, the number is 800. So, and 2022 to today was a record. It was, it was uh, uh, you know, unprecedented in the last few decades. Uh, so now in three weeks they've done, you know, what took basically oh, nearly two years. So I think, again, that it's, it's a very volatile uh, situation. That I think the survival of the PA is um, very much in question. Um, we got glimpses of what looked like the beginning of the end for the PA a couple of weeks ago with major protests in city centers in the West Bank and the PA security forces, you know, they're driving their jeeps into crowds. Um, so, uh, yeah, everything is extremely 
unstable, and, and I think the effects will be contradictory. Yeah. F for those of us um, who are working either in this country or um, in Israel and Palestine to end occupation, um, how, if at all, do you see the events of October 7th changing the conversation about occupation or the approach and strategy that ought to be advanced to end occupation? I mean, the, the main thing, as I say, is I, I think that there is now, you know, it's irrefutable that managing the conflict doesn't work. It's not, that, that's not a model that any Israeli wants to, to see pursued if, if, that, if it comes at this kind of a price. Um, so I, th I think that the, the, that's really the primary effect, and that opens up the possibility for all kinds of n new, new arrangements. At the very least, the Israeli government is currently saying there has to be a totally new arrangement in Gaza. Um, and I think they will have a lot of trouble doing the kind of arrangement that they want, which would, they say months, I think it would take a lot longer. They're losing, you know, a billion and a half shekels a day, uh, calling up 350,000 reservists. It's just not, it's not sustainable. Um, so, uh, I, I, I believe that there will be, and, and again, we have to see. There, right now, everybody's in a state of grief and rage, and you know, it's very hard to have any kind of opposition at this moment. But I do think that those people who are out uh, in huge numbers in the protests against the judicial reform prior to October 7th I think they, that's a voice that isn't going to disappear, and I think that those people will come out eventually once things have become more clear and settled in some way in Gaza, and, uh, and they will blame the government and the prime minister for October 7th. Uh, I think there's no question about that. And, and, I, and the question is, out of that, you know, the Palestinian issue was largely ignored in those protests. That was one of the critiques of it. There were fights on the left about, do we engage with it? Do we legitimize it or not? What uh, flags are allowed. Yes, what flags are allowed. And now, you know, those people can't come out without it being centrally about the Palestinian issue. So, yeah. I'll, I'll take us back into the book. Um, but, but I think that this question, while, while being to some degree specifically about the people and the relationships in the book, is, is also a question about charting a path forward. Um, for me, one of the most remarkable aspects of, of your book um, is that it's evident that the people that you spoke to, both Israeli and Palestinian, trust you and were willing to share some really intimate details about their own lives as it pertains to the particulars of the tragedy and beyond. And, and I'm thinking about this moment that we're in where people are rushing to the predefined camps and planting their flag in the sand and making it difficult, more and more difficult to see each other and to connect and to tell, to tell your story and to hear someone else's story. Um, and so maybe there's something instructive that you can share about how it was that you, in a climate of deep mistrust between people, how, how did you build these relationships of trust? I think in particular with the, with the Palestinians that you spoke with that um, enabled you to, to see their humanity and to tell their story for us to learn from. Um, so I think, you know, part of the... Um, I mean, there, there was a... I should say that it was not uncomplicated um, to tell uh, such intimate stories of uh, people's lives. And the main character of this book, Abed, really shared a lot with me that hadn't been shared even with his own family members and, and other characters as well. And there were a couple of things that were happening there. One was that Many of these parents and these families were um, 
there was a cloud of silence over the accident. And everybody was afraid of upsetting the bereaved. So they wouldn't bring it up. They wouldn't talk about the you know, deceased child. And those, many of those parents were yearning to talk about it. And so when I came to them, it just came pouring out. Um, and I think the fact that I was an outsider also helped because this is a very tightly knit community. And if a Palestinian journalist had come to them, they immediately would know how many degrees of separation and which cousin this person knows and this might come back to, and you'd be much more cautious. But with me, it was like a book, an English, you know, whatever. Uh, and, and so with Abed, I had a real dilemma, which was, um, you know, typically you never share with the subject of a, of a work uh, that you don't share the manuscript with them. Um, it's just not done. And in this case, I kind of felt a real obligation to do it because of how many details he provided. Uh, and it was really exposing himself in front of his whole community. And, um, and in the end, I decided not to do it because I just did not want to have to litigate every detail with him, and I knew the work would suffer for it. Um, and so I gave him a hardcover in August, as soon as I got one. And he called me two days later and said, um, so I've read the first part of the book, which is all about his love lives. And lo love lives with people who are still in this community, and a betrayal by his sister-in-law who lives next door that he's never confronted her with, and many, many, many uh, details about who his first love wound up marrying, somebody she actually wrote in a letter she loathed more than anyone else in the community. So uh, he wrote to me after reading that first part, and, and not wrote to me, he called me after reading that part, first part, and he said, and keep in mind, I had had months of anxiety over his reaction to this book. And my wife just kept saying to me, just show him the book, just show him the book, this is destroying you. And so he called, the first call, and he's like, he's very upset. Mm. And he said, you know, it's all true, but um, I really didn't expect there to be this, these many, this many details. Mm. And uh, I'm gonna be in so much trouble with everyone in, in Anatta, you know, Fata, I talk shit about Fata, I'm, you know, like, everyone's gonna come after me. And, uh, and so I said to him, just please, you know, read to the end. Believe it or not, other people revealed more. <laughs> uh, and, and so he did, and then a few days later he called me and he said, I understand what you're doing, and I accept it, and I'm ready to, to face the consequences. Uh, it's my story, and I have a right to tell it. And so, um, yeah, in, in terms of the, the trust, you know, I spent a lot of time with him. He, he was interviewed a lot. We were on book tour together. He had to cut it short because of his family. Uh, all the, the whole environment in the West Bank right now feels like the second intifada. He just, his wife's uh, cousin was just shot and killed yesterday in, in Albire. Um, so, um, so he had to leave, but on the tour, I, he was asked many times, you know, why did you trust this guy? And I kind of heard the answer to that for the first time when we were doing these events together. And he, what he usually said was, you know, uh, I, the, I trusted him because he was grieving with me, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that's, that's what stood out um, in, in your answer when you spoke about um, the culture of, oh, the conspiracy of silence in the community and the desire not to upset these bereaved parents and so never bringing up these stories and the ways that that actually you know, deepens the wound and isolates the bereaved in their suffering. And then in you come and say, I'm, I'm ready to grieve with you. Yeah. 
right? And I'm ready to um, help you find community within your grief. And, and that to me, um, I mean, I think that was also the message of the parent circle I mentioned earlier, who was, was here two, two weeks ago, um, which this is an organization that's, that's facilitated based, based um, in Israel, and it's, and it's co-facilitated by Palestinian and Israeli parents who have lost children due to the conflict. And they travel together, and they tell the stories um, of their children who died. And, and their main message is, um, we don't want anyone else to join this group. Right? And, and the act of grieving together, it, it doesn't necessarily bring forgiveness. It doesn't necessarily bring uh, political solution, right? but it does highlight the humanity and the shared losses, right? the, the lose-lose. Um, I want to conclude by reading something that you wrote back to you. I always imagine that authors get nervous when the facilitator says nervous. this. I don't mean to make you nervous. Um, here's, here's the clue. Um, this is from your, the acknowledgments. This is from the acknowledgments, which you, you or your publisher placed at the end of the book, which I sort of liked, because I normally read, that's the first thing I read, and it's like, I don't know any of these people that you're thinking, but by the end of the book, I had a sense of who some of these people were. Um, and I was just, I was, I was moved, and I was touched, and I want to I wanna, um, ask you to to share a little bit more about this specific passage you wrote. Our three daughters, Juno, Tessa, and Zoe, have grown up in Jerusalem just over the wall that segregates them from the children in this book. Although that segregation seems unlikely to end in my lifetime, I wrote the book in the hope that it can be dismantled in theirs. And so I wanna ask you, what anchors that hope? I have to say, I mean, I, 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 after October 7th, I really do feel greater despair than I've ever felt. And whatever hope that I had, and that was very cautiously phrased, not in my lifetime, you know, I, I really, despite what I said about openness to two states and whatever, I mean, there is a path, but it's a narrow one. I wouldn't bet on it. And uh, mainly what I feel is great, great despair. Um, it, one of the hardest things about what's happening now is that it doesn't feel as awful as it is. It feels to me like the beginning of something. Um, and, you know, but the, but the main thing that anchors that hope is, you know, the, the human beings that I'm around. I mean, the, the Abed and embrace, his family's embrace of me and my kids. You know, one of my closest colleagues, I, I first started working for a, a conflict resolution organization in, in, and I lived in Gaza for six weeks. And my colleague there is like an uncle to my... Um, to my children, his daughter named her daughter, her baby daughter, after my wife, Judy, and probably the only baby Judy in all of Gaza. I'm constantly on, you know, the WhatsApp trying to find out how baby Judy is doing. Um, so it's, 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 it's human, and it's also my, my good friends who, who Israeli Jews who are devoting their life to this, to this work. And, um, you know, and, and, and at the end of the day, you know, when you sit with people, they understand, they recognize. There's a, a wall, there's a, an armor, there's a shield. There are talking points, but, you know, at the end of the book, I, um, there's, there's a, a couple of characters who live in a settlement that's on the land of Anatta, uh, that's called Anatot, that is uh, partially a, on Abed's family land. And a couple of these uh, uh, settlers came to, uh, to visit Abed for this TV special that was made about 
the accident and the Israeli reaction to the accident. And there was another s settler in Anatot who appears elsewhere in the book who's a good friend of Abed's uh, cousin who works in the PA. And I sat with this guy, he's a kind of security official at in, the, uh, in a nearby settlement, and he's one of the kind of more senior figures in, in Anatot. And, uh, and we were talking, and he was telling me how much he resents the Israeli left, actually. Like, that, you know, how they ride on, you know, on this high horse and give me a break. You know, they're living actually in people's, in actual Palestinian homes. We're building something new on an empty hill, you know. How many settlements are in an actual Palestinian home? They're all hypocrites. And, uh, and, and it is just how much he, re he resented the kind of sanctimony of the Israeli left that treats them as they're you know, the problem and they're these devils. And, um, and, I, and, I just, and, and he told me one anecdote from dealing with Ron Pundak, a, a major figure from Oslo, um, how, he, how he had been dealing with Ron Pundak's organization and someone from it had said, you know, he wanted to do an economic cooperation project with Anatta. And this person said, I know what you want. You really want uh, that you'll be, you know, the masters and they'll be the slaves and you'll, you know, profit economically from this, whatever it was going to be, an industrial zone. And he so resented that attitude, uh, which is the furthest thing from what he had in mind for uh, this industrial zone, but definitely he had in mind that he would stay in his home, the settlement would stay, and that the Palestinians would learn to accept it. That he did have in mind. And, uh, and I said to him, you know, okay, I understand uh, what you're saying, but let me just ask you, you know, you see how these people live, they're right there, um, it's a walled ghetto, do you think that you have, or Israelis have uh, any responsibility for them? And he's never asked that question. And he just kind of, he sighed and he thought, and he was silent for like 30 seconds, and he said, maybe. And, and I think that, I think that's, you know, the, I think that's, everybody actually understands that Israeli Jews aren't going anywhere, Palestinians aren't going anywhere. There's going to have to be a way for them to live together. And thank you so much, Nathan Thrall, for coming and speaking with us. Thank you. And if you haven't already, really encourage you to get your hands on this book and, and, and read it and allow yourself to be moved by it and, and inspired by it. And um, I just want to offer a closing prayer that um, in the days ahead, um, baby Judy remains safe. Um, and your Judy and her parents who are there remain safe. Um, and that we find the right questions to ask each other that creates that small but narrow opening in the human heart to, to see each other and to realize um, that we can live side by side. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you.